uh, in the previous lecture, we've started looking at products of subspaces. However, there were a couple of questions that were asked, uh, which I felt I should share with all of you, at least the answers to those questions. So one of those questions was an interesting one, which said that, look, we had these objects, these vector spaces V, then their duals, and then their double duals, right? And we showed that there is a natural isomorphism between these two, all right? But it's a very important point to note that in general, if these are not finite dimensional, then you should not expect isomorphism. In fact, it so happens that if these are not finite dimensional vector spaces, the double dual is a much bigger vector space than the original vector space, all right? So that map which I had constructed, if you go through there, you'll see that that injection, the injectivity of that map is beyond question. However, we did not prove the surjectivity. Instead, we argued that since they're of equal dimension, injectivity implies surjectivity. Now, if that equality of dimension is not assumed a priori, and that is only valid if it's finite dimensions, right? In infinite dimensions, you cannot equate dimensions. In such a case that surjectivity is no longer true, all right? So all of this is very specific to finite dimensional vector spaces, not in general for any vector space, all right? So we would do well to remember that. That's the first point uh, that I would like to get out of the way. The second was this uh, dual map that we had defined, remember? When we have this T, which is a mapping from some V to U probably we had chosen. And then we describe this dual map, which is from the dual of U to the dual of V. Now, of course, by this notation itself, you can guess that we are assuming it's linear, but you should not assume it's linear. You should just go ahead and check that this is indeed linear in the way in which we have defined it, right? You remember that composition we had defined, right? That phi, this is how we had defined this, is it not? So I leave it to you to check that this is indeed going to be linear in the sense of a linear map, right? So that's the second question that was posed and I just thought before we proceed with what we were doing towards the end of the previous lecture, maybe we would clarify this. So I hope that those of you who had asked that question, uh, that is well and truly now explained, right? All right, so we were looking at products of subspaces. Right. So suppose you have V1, V2, until Vk, all being subspaces of V. And V is a finite dimensional vector space. Now, of course, I've defined what this product of subspace is going to be like. The point is that we're going to now try and explore what the dimension of this product is going to be. First thing you have to prove is that this is indeed a subspace, which is uh, the object V1 cross V2, so on, till Vk is a rather a vector space in its own right. Now this, of course, subject to the rules of addition vector addition and scalar multiplication that we have described in the previous lecture, you should be able to readily check that all of them check out because of the inherent structure that is there in each of these Vs, these Vis, the, the vector space, the fact that this is a vector space is beyond any doubt now, right? Now, once we have assured ourselves that this is a vector space and not just that, but the fact that this, each of these V1 through Vk are residing inside some finite dimensional vector space. The next logical question then to ask is, is this also finite dimensional? And if so, then what could be a potential way of showing that this is also finite dimensional? Of course, if you can explicitly construct a basis that is finite, you're done. So that is exactly what we are going to do. So suppose you have B V1, B V2 until B V K are basis for V1 
v 2 v k respectively with the cardinality of b v i being given by m i right that is the cardinality of the set the number of elements distinct elements in that set. So, in B v i the number of distinct elements is m i right. So, the claim would be uh, maybe I should write an explicit expression for what these B v 1 through so, let us say B v 1 is equal to v 1 1, v 1 2 until v 1 m 1, b v 2 is equal to v 2 1, v 2 2 until v 2 m 2, so on till b v k is equal to v k 1, v k 2 until v k m k right. So, that is an explicit way of just listing out all the members that are there in this individual basis ok. So, the claim would be that this v 1 1 added with zeros then v 1 2 added with zeros until v 1 m 1 added with zeros. So, how many is that? That is m 1 vectors. Notice that each of these belongs to the product right. There is an order where the first of these fellows comes from the vector space v 1 and these are the zeros of v 2, v 3, v 4 till v k right. So, these are all individual members of this product. How many are there? Exactly m 1 so far. Next we carry on. Now, we take this as 0 and we take v 2 1 and pad the rest with zeros so on. I am just going to write the last one now 0 v 2 m 2 0. So, how many are there? This is exactly m 1 such fellows yeah. This is m 2 such fellows just keep count that is the most important thing here and we will likewise have m 3 such vectors m 4 such vectors so on until we go to the last one where we start with 0 0 and the first one from the last list which is v k 1. v k m k right. So, what about this set then? This is m k in number right. So, there is m 1 vectors, m 2 vectors so on till m 3, m 4, m 5 until m k vectors. So, the total number of fellows in this set the cardinality of this set all right. So, let me give this set the name b 
yeah, is a basis for v1 cross v2 cross go all the way to vk. So, that is the claim. So, what is the total number of fellows in here? Summation mi, i going from 1 through k, right. So, if this is indeed true, then we know that the dimension of this product is equal to the sum of the individual dimensions. What do we need to show in order to prove that this is a basis? Well, as usual, two things. One, the fact that this is going to be linearly independent and two, the fact that this is going to be a generating set for every vector inside this product, right. So, that is what we shall now endeavor to verify. Okay. Let us retain that. Okay. <clears throat> so, suppose summation alpha i or rather alpha 1 j alpha 1 j j going from 1 through m 1. j going from 1 through m 2 v 2 j until summation alpha k j j going from 1 through m k v k j is equal to 0. 0 of what? Well, of course, 0 of the product. What does this mean? It means I have already taken a linear combination of these fellows. Please check. If you follow the rules of uh, vector addition and scalar multiplication on the product space, this is already there in that form. Right? So, if that is so, what does it mean to equal 0? What does the 0 in this vector space look like? That is going to be 0, 0, yeah, it is a 0 of v 1, it is a 0 of v 2 and this is a 0 of v k, clear? Now, if that has to be true, then each of these individually have to equate to 0 of the respective vector space right. This means that summation alpha i j v i j j going from 1 through m i. I hope the indices are right. Yeah, they are. Is equal to 0 for i is equal to 1, 2 until k. Yeah, is all right? Because each of those individually have to vanish because they have to equate with each of these on the right hand side. But what does this mean? What are these fellows after all? That list that I just erased, these fellows are nothing but elements from the individual basis of the vector spaces v1, v2, v3 and therefore, these are fellows that are coming from a linearly independent set. So, if you are asking for them to be 0, then it cannot help but lead to the conclusion that alpha i j is equal to 0 for all i j, <clears throat> which essentially means that whenever you take a linear combination of vectors in the set B, it can only result in 0 
if all those coefficients are 0. That means B is a linearly independent set, right? So one part of the, of the proof is quite straightforward from this. What about the second part? Does it require much effort? What do I have to show? I have to show that you pick any arbitrary object inside this product space and I should be able to write it as a linear combination of fellows inside this set B. I am not going to completely write that down, I am just going to tell you how that works. So choose any arbitrary, choose an arbitrary V1, V2, Vk belonging to V1 cross V2 cross till Vk and observe that Vi is equal to summation alpha i j uh, what were those numbers I wonder okay mm. yeah I think this is how, how we were expressing them so it is v i j right where j was the sum j is equal to 1 to m i yeah since b v i is a basis and therefore a generating set for v i and it is done. You agree that it is done? I am not completing the entire reasoning. The point is you pick out any of these vi's, they individually come from, so this one comes from v1, this one comes from v2, this one comes from vk, it does not matter. Pick out any one of them. These individual fellows can be written as a linear combination of the fellows in that respective basis, but those are already sitting in here, only padded with some zeros on this side or that side. So the moment you observe that these fellows can be written as linear combinations of individual bases, there is nothing really to prove in showing that uh, there is a, that this, this is a generating set. It is quite obvious, is it not? Please ask if there is any doubt about this. If not, because then I am leaving you, the rest to you to complete the, the remainder of the reasoning. Is that obvious? Is that clear? Okay, good. So then, obviously, once we have explicitly shown you one such basis, it is straightforward to write that the important result that dimension of V1 cross V2 cross V3 Vk is equal to summation of the dimensions of the individual Vi's i going from 1 through I am claiming this is exactly what I have proved. By constructing a basis, I have just proved this. Okay? So we could let matters rest here in so far as uh, products of subspaces are concerned. You can just uh, look through certain examples of these products of subspaces, the familiar subspaces that you might have seen apart from the Euclidean ones. And you can check out these uh, different cute aspects of these results and so on. Right? But at this point, 
there is something that is sort of lurking here and is a bit too tempting to forego. What other kind of a subspace do you remember where you know it turns out that the dimensions get added up? Direct sum. Direct sum, right? So here is a result that's almost crying to be investigated. Now, if this fellow's dimension is equal to this, and we know that a direct sum's dimension is also equal to this, both being finite dimensional, one must be able to then infer that they are isomorphic. Because equal dimensions means for finite dimensional vector spaces, they must be isomorphic. So we wonder what could be such a potential isomorphism in case you are faced with a direct sum. So that will sort of bring the story to a close and also allow us to relate this product with another object that you are aware of, right? So I'm going to just talk about this map, say gamma, which is a mapping from Actually, I'll not right away define this as a direct sum. I'll just take it as a sum for the moment. And let's see what happens. How is this given? It is given like so. Right, it takes an object v1, v2, vk and maps it to v1 plus v2 plus v3 right <clears throat> so that means it takes an object such as this sitting inside here and maps it to this for the time being we haven't used the symbol for direct sum all right that's because we will ask one or two questions before we assign that direct sum label here, right? <clears throat> so what can we say about this map gamma? Can we say that this is a surjection? If I were to claim that gamma is a surjection, would you object to it? Would you be able to object to it? Yeah, you can of course object to a lot of things, but that doesn't make it true. The point is, every time I've written something out like this, it guarantees that such objects exist inside these individual vector spaces. So there must be a pre-image that maps to this. So surjection is quite obvious. Again, what does surjection mean? That every time I give you an object here, you should be able to find a pre-image here. Now, the moment I give you an object like this already, just go ahead and look at this. It's quite straightforward, right? So surjection is really quite straightforward. What is not very obvious is injection. Now there, unless I have imposed the condition that this is a direct sum, it is not going to follow directly that this is an injection. Why? Because when I am asking for injectivity, I am going to investigate the kernel of this map. So I am going to ask for that fellow in the product which leads to 0 in the sum. Now if it is not a direct sum, then I cannot have the property or cannot assume the property that every vector therein is uniquely representable. Remember the definition of the direct sum? Every vector in a direct sum has a unique representation. So this zero <clears throat> may not have a unique representation unless, what? Unless it's a direct sum. In fact, if you look at subspaces that have anything other than zero in common, then you go ahead and pick that object. See what I'm saying? What I'm saying is suppose, any two of these fellows have some vector, some non-zero vector in common, say some vector called P. 
then what you do is you just write uh, 0 plus dot 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 plus p plus dot 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 again 0 and then write this as minus p. So because this fellow p belongs to at least two of them, therefore minus p also belongs to two of them because the vector space must be closed under vector addition, right? and additive inverse must exist. So therefore, this is clearly a combination of fellows, not all of whom are 0 and yet it results in 0. You see the point. So unless it is a direct sum, it is not just the 0 that maps to the 0, there are also other fellows in addition to the 0 which also map to 0. So if you want injectivity, then Right? Clear on this? On the other hand, if it is a direct sum, <coughs> then of course no two of the fellows have anything in common. Right? Their intersections, no matter how many of their intersections you take at a time, they have nothing other than the zero vector in common. So the only way you are going to be able to ever write this zero is by choosing zeros from each of the individual vector spaces here in your domain. So the kernel is then trivial which means it is injective. So the direct sum implies it is injective and because the direct sum implies it is injective this is also another way of proving that result which you might have proved in your second assignment which is that dimension of a direct sum i going from 1 through k v i is equal to summation dimension v i i going from 1 through k because I have already established it is a surjection and I have now shown that if it is a direct sum then it is also an injection well you might argue is it linear I leave that to you to check just being a surjection and a bijection is not enough, it must be a linear bijection, right. So of course this map gamma, just go ahead and verify that this is linear. So that is your exercise, not a big deal. So once you have linearity, surjection, injection, this is an isomorphism. If it is an isomorphism, then it means that for a direct sum it is this. You have seen already one proof in the solutions of the assignment and now this is another way of arguing the same thing, right. So we will bring this uh, uh, section on products of subspaces to a close and now we will move on to something else, yes. Sir, uh, is this equal to the dimension of V or V? Uh, no, of course not. I have not spoken anything about V. These are just random subspaces. If it is a direct sum then you are basically assuming that these subspaces have nothing other than 0 in common. So I am not asking about a complete decomposition of the entire vector space into you know these. We will do something similar to that. We will look at things like those in terms of so called A invariant subspaces when we study the eigenvalue eigenvector problems, right. A complete decomposition of the entire vector space written in the form of a direct sum but not yet. Okay.